if you look at the material, white has an extra rook and two pawns for three pieces. Black has three minor pieces, this one, this one, and this one. So in fact, if you look at this materialistically, that's like nine pawns to seven. But here white has this incredible attack. The rook and queen are on the seventh rank. The black king is stuck in the middle of the board. Black is barely defending. This position is wild, unclear. Obviously, white is to be preferred here. It's a vintage tall chess position. That was black's best try. Okay, so we've seen white has played the move. Bishop takes b5. Preparing to bring his rook into the game, opening up all these wild tactics. We've just been looking at what happens if black had played knight g6, going straight after the white queen. And we found that incredible try of knight d4, rook e7, bishop takes g7, rook takes g7, and then the incredible rock thrown into the gears of black's defense is bishop to d7. All those tactics lead to crazy places that are on the whole good for white. But black can still hold on, maybe. So instead of that, black played the move rook f7. He realizes that knight g6 doesn't quite work. Rook f7 gets out of the bishop's attack, consolidates by defending the e6 square with his bishop on c8. If he were to take on b5, white would have a little bit more time for the attack, playing moves like knight d4, and after the rook moves, knight c takes b5, white has a big attack here. After rook f7, you're tall. White to move. Very good. Well, you already know that you played bishop takes b5 in order to open up the rook jumping to the g1 square because you want to pile up on the g7 pawn and you want to stop this annoying reality of knight g6 being a, a win of the your trapped queen on h8. So rook g1 is the logical move and that's what tall played. You're threatening to take on g7. Black has very little choice but to play rook a7. If you were to play a move like a takes b5, then after rook g takes g7, all the defenses are falling apart. White's completely winning. You can analyze this on your own if you, a little bit if you want, just to fool around with the tactics, but this is overwhelming. After rook a7, black brings one more piece to defending the g7 square. Here Tall played knight d4. Now, Take a moment and look at this position. Put yourself in black shoes. Imagine the mental pressure involved in defending. This is what it's like to play against tall. Everything is hanging up in the air. What can black do? Well, one thing that's hanging is the bishop on b5. But after a takes b5, knight d takes b5, we can keep this knight on c3, guarding the a2 pawn. Then the rook, the queen, the bishop are all threatened. After the rook falls... The queen moves, say, for example, knight takes a7. Queen takes a7. Rook takes g7, check. It's all over. Black just cannot defend. So here Kablonks played a very strong defensive try, knight g4. This is a typical move of a strong player defending a difficult position. He's giving up a little material. He's up a piece, and also this bishop on b5 is hanging, so he realizes that if he can shut down the g-file, force Tall to play a move like f takes g4, and slow things down, he might be able to defend. Also, the move bishop f4 check is in the air, which is trying to trade off some attackers. Very often, if your opponent has a huge initiative, what you want to look for, you want to look for a way to give back a little bit of material to open up a simplification of the position, a trade. If you can trade down some of the attacking pieces, you might be able to defend. Knight g4 is a good try. Tall played f takes g4, and here came the decisive mistake. Kablonks should have played bishop f4 check, which is a principal decision, trading down this bishop. He played bishop e5, defending that g7 square. Here Kablonks played bishop to e5. The best move would have been bishop to f4 check. After bishop takes f4, queen takes f4, king b1, still white's threatening to play g takes f5 and piling up on that g7 square. But here after queen takes d4, evening out the material, tall would play rook g to h1. And now, do you see the threat for tall? 
Mate and two. Exactly. Queen takes g8. King takes g8. And rook h8 is checkmate. But here, once again, we see the principles in action. Koblanks could defend that mate and counterattack. The very strong move, rook f to b7. You see that opens up the f7 square for the white king, and it puts the rook on this very interesting b file where if this bishop moves out of the way and it's attacked, the option of queen takes c3, threatening mate on b2, and utilizing the pinned pawn on b2 might be very important. In this position, Jan Timmen, the Dutch grandmaster who analyzed this game very deeply, suggested that after g5, Tall would still have a good position with a very good attack. I'm not quite so sure. I think that if Black were to play e5, with the idea of meeting g6, which was Timmen's idea, g6 guards that f7 square, so now queen takes g8, king takes g8, rook h8 would be checkmate once more. Here Black could play bishop e6, guarding that square, so if queen takes g8 now, bishop takes g8 can be played. Here, black is defending, he's counterattacking on the queen side. This looks pretty good for black. I should also mention that here there's this other option. White could play the incredible move bishop to e8, guarding the f7 square, utilizing the principle of removing the defender, because if black were to play king takes e8, then queen takes g8. Once that queen jumps into the board, it's deadly. The king has to move, the rook can take on g7. Next, the bishop on c8 will fall. White's completely winning. But here, after bishop e8, once again, black can play the move bishop to e6, defending with a cool head, guarding that g8 square. Remember, the move bishop e8 had the idea of just stopping black's king's access to the f7 square, so now queen takes g8 followed by rook h8 was a checkmate combination coming. Bishop e6 defends the g8 square. It looks to me like black's defending here. This could have been big trouble for Tall. Once again, you see the power of principles. Koblanks played bishop e5. Koblanks was a very strong chess player. But keep in mind, if you think about the principles, if you think my opponent has an attack, is there any way for me to trade down an attacking piece? Bishop f4 check is the principled move. Then your intuition, your intuitive understanding of the principles leads you to find a move like bishop f4, and then you try to make it work. First, your intuition, your understanding of the principles, your putting of the principles together. That is what makes you find the move. Then you have to see if the tactics support the discovery. Bishop f4 check works tactically, and you can know to look in that direction because it's a principled decision. Instead, bishop e5 was played. This is guarding that g7 square. The downside to a move like bishop e5, the bishop on e5 took on c3. One way to look at this is, what is he left behind? The bishop on e5 had the potential to guard this critical diagonal. Now the bishop has left that diagonal. It's on c3. Tal played the move, bishop on h6, back to e3. He didn't take back on c3. He didn't want to waste time allowing b takes c3, a takes b5. Suddenly his king is open, the knight on c6 is unprotected, black has potential counterplay. He didn't want to mess with that. Instead, Bishop e3 is a fantastic move. The threat, do you see it? Of course, we're threatening the rook on a7, but the real threat is bishop to c5 check, hitting the king from another diagonal. When the bishop was on e5, it could jump back to d6, but now with the bishop on c3, bishop e3 to c5 check, that e7 square is covered by my knight and bishop. If the king goes to e8, then queen takes g8, will win the game you've removed the defender of the g8 knight. So, bishop coming to e3, the threat is bishop c5, but also what he's done critically is open up the h file. You'll see why that matters in a second. After d4, a natural move, very strong, blocking off the bishop's access to the c5 square, but also notice blocking off the access of the bishop on c3, defending the g7 point. Now, it's white's move. Tall switch directions again towards the h file, rook g to h1. Here, do you see white's threat? White is threatening mate in two. If it's your move with white in this position, what would you do? 
Queen takes g8 check. Excellent. A queen sacrifice to top it off. King takes g8. Rook h8 is checkmate. So black has to make room for his king. He played the move rook d7. Now queen takes g8 doesn't work anymore because if king takes g8, rook h8, the f7 square is opened up, king f7 is possible, and black's fine. Each move of Tall's here is coming from left field. He moved his bishop from h6 back to e3. h6 looked like a fantastic attacking square. Now Tall switched gears again. He played bishop to g5. What's his idea? His idea is to block the defense. You see this battery of the rook on d7, queen on c7, and rook on a7 are all locking down the g7 point. Tall's idea by playing bishop to g5 is to throw a piece, a bishop, a knight, into e7, blocking all three of those pieces defending. Here, Koblenz played a takes b5, taking that bishop that's been hanging for so long but he never had time for it before. This is the incredible move now coming from Tall, which was his really powerful hidden plan lurking in the position for a long time. White to move. Take your time. You see how you can bring one more piece deeper into the attack? Okay, here. You're Tall. Be creative. What do you think he had in mind? Way to go. Don't worry if you don't see this. This is hard. Tall played the move Rook 1 to H6. It's very rare that you'll see this kind of chess position. The queen on H8 is trapped. The rook on H7 is trapped. The rook goes to H6 to a square, which can be captured by a pawn. His idea here is after G takes H6, bishop takes H6. If the king moves, then queen takes G8 as checkmate. And after rook G7, well, white's just going to win the queen. The idea here is after g takes h6, bishop h6, if king e8, then queen g8 is checkmate, black has to play the move rook g7, blocking off that check, and now black is completely paralyzed. White can even take a minute here and play b takes c3. Just take the thing. But the truth is that black is completely locked down, and that's what Tall realized. Here he can play b takes c3. The queen can't leave the defense of the g7 square. For example, after queen takes c6 here, bishop takes g7. If rook takes g7, then what do you play for white? Good. Queen takes g7, king e8, and then queen takes g8 is checkmate. So that's just a tactic supporting the idea. g takes h6 is impossible. But you can really see Tall's idea after rook takes a2. You see here, black is counterattacking. Black's threat is rook a1, checkmate, because the bishop on c3 guards that d2 square. But what Tall had in mind in this position was to weave his way into the black camp. White to move. You see what he had in mind? Well done. Here Tall would play the move rook f6 check. Fantastic. So the knight can't take the rook because it's pinned to the king. If black plays rook f7, blocking the attack, then this piece on f7 is suddenly pinned. Queen takes g7 check is possible because the rook is no longer able to move. After the king moves, queen takes g8 will force checkmate. So after rook f6 check, the only real try for black is to take it. g takes. But now, do you see what he had in mind? Excellent. Bishop to h6. He's forced the pawn away from this critical defensive square. The bishop returns to h6, where it was many moves ago. And now, if the king moves to e8, what does white play? Good. Queen takes g8 as checkmate. And if he blocks with rook to g7, there are no more defenders of that square. Bishop takes g7. Check. Don't forget, we do not have time for a quiet move, a move that isn't checked because black has a counterplay. Rook a1 will be mate any time. So bishop takes g7 is check. If the king moves to e8, the g8 knight hangs with check. So the king has to go to f7. Now, what do we play? 
Bishop takes f6. Discovered check. Very good. And now, what do we play? Queen takes g8. Very good. And if the king jumps up to the g6 square, well, now we can also mate. Queen takes g8 check. The only way to block it is queen g7. And now, checkmate in one move. Either option would work. Rook takes g7 or queen takes g7 wins the game. So, white's threat was rook to f6 check. To get a sense for what it must be like to play against tall, imagine defending this position with black. There are so many options for you, and every one, or virtually every one, gets mated by force, loses to an incredible sacrificial attack. Here, Koblanks played d3. He kept his head on straight. He counterplays. d3, preparing some kind of thrust like d2 check. Suddenly, white's king is looking pretty loose here. And he opens up a defensive resource. The bishop on c3 slices down, guarding not only the g7 square, but stopping rook f6. This is high-level defensive chess. Sometimes we attack, and even if we're great attackers, if we love to attack more than anything, sometimes opponents will take the initiative. We have to be prepared to think our way through the most blistering attacks. Here, with a present mind, d3, Guards g7, counterattacks, very good. Now, tall. Once again, quiet, clear. He sees that black's bishop on c3 is a key defensive piece, stopping the f6 square, stopping the g7 square. What do you do? Remove the defender. A simple move. He takes c3. Reigniting the threat of rook f6 check. If any of these complications don't seem clear, take your time, work through them. There's no reason to rush through this course. If I move past a position, set it up on your chessboard, look at it on the screen, take your time. Make sure you understand the ideas of Tal's attack. Remember, in general, when you're studying chess, if your brain hurts, if you're pushing yourself, if you're stretching your mind, then you're learning. If you just play through these variations, if you don't strain to try to understand them, then you're not going to be learning. Basically, you're going to get out of chess as much as you put into it. Here, rook f6 check is a threat once more. d2, counterplay, checking the white king. You have to go to d1, otherwise a promotion can happen. King d1, and now queen takes c6. The position has come to a head. Black's threat is very simple. Queen f3 check. That's going to be mate right there. So now, Tall has made all these wonderful quiet, building moves, he's been maneuvering, he's built his attack with tremendous skill. No more time for slow moves. White to play, you're tall. Bring it home. Well done. Rook f6 check. We know that's the idea. The knight can't take it because it's pinned. Here Blanc's blocked with rook f7. You see what happens after g takes f6? Well done. Right. Bishop h6 check. Now if the king moves to e8, what do you play? Exactly. Queen takes g8 as checkmate. Black has to block with the rook on g7. Now, remember, there's no time for a quiet move. If we... Make a move that isn't checked, queen f3, will cause us big problems. Here, you play bishop takes g7, king e7. You've got the king on the run. The whole attack has been based around the idea that black's king is guarding that g8 knight. Black's king was one of the most important defenders in the game. Now, the king is running. And remember the principle I told you. When you have a king running, bring it up the board. Bring it towards you. King e7, bishop takes f6 check. A discovered attack. The king has to go to d6. Can you check that king again? Very good. Bishop to e5 check. The king has to come up the board. King d5. And now. Here the bishop is on e5. If the queen were on e5, it would be mate. 
The best move for white is bishop to b8. One last relatively quiet move in the middle of the whole attack. And then if black plays rook takes h7, what does white play? The best move is queen d4 checkmate. Very good. The king is stuck on d5, right in the middle of the board. Okay, black's up a rook and a piece, but he's checkmated. Queen d4. So here Kablonk's defended with rook f7. And now we've got in the position what we've wanted to get all along, an overloaded piece. The rook on f7 is overloaded. You're tall. White to play. What do you do? Queen takes g7. Very good. King e8. King e7 would obviously lose because it's going into a discovered attack. The rook can take on f7 check, for example, double check, bishop and rook. All of black's pieces fall apart. Queen takes g7. Very good. Utilizing the pinned piece. The rook on f7 can't take on g7. It's pinned. All of black's pieces fall apart here. And here, Oblonks resigned. Tall won the game. The complications are pretty straightforward at this point. After king e7, do you see what he would do? Just another astonishing tall masterpiece. Could he play or what? Wow. There was never a greater attacking chess player. Nor was there ever a player who had more psychological power over the board. Sure, Black could have defended better, but his brain was under so much psychological and technical pressure that he just couldn't weave his way through. Also, it's important to remember that Tall was used to this type of position because he usually guided games into his kind of chaos. Opponents were often in objectively fine positions against him, but they were out of their elements and under terrifying pressure. This is the power of developing your chess style around your natural strengths and then guiding the game into that kind of position. Now imagine the tragedy of taking someone like Tall and trying to force them into a Karpovian positional mold. Don't let your inner stallion be broken. You must play, learn, and live in a manner that is true to yourself.